So, good afternoon. I'm Daniel, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, formal verification made easy and fast, for sure fast. And uh, this is an academic uh, subject because I'm trying to, to stay in the university because that's my excuse for my girlfriend. So why I'm stay studying, I, I don't need to, to ask more compromises. So that's why I try to feed like uh, Linux as is and the academic stuff, trying to improve both situations. Mainly because Linux is complex, right? We know a little bit about a part of the kernel. For example, I work with the scheduling, but I have to, to be fair and say that I don't know about the fair scheduler, right? Things are complex. We have uh, the integration of many subsystems. We have a uh, locking in the file system. Nobody knows all the picture. And describe the behavior of all the picture it is hard, right? And uh, Linux is critical, and it's more critical than ever because there are people like BMW that are thinking to use Linux on cars, on cyber physical systems, for example. So the more and more we need to be sure that Linux behaves as expected, right? But what do we expect from Linux? So. We have a lot of documentation say what we expect from Linux, right? In many different languages. <laughs> I learned Linux in Portuguese. And uh, we have a lot of ifs inside the kernel saying, okay, this should not happen, or this specific case should not happen. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of test cases that try to check if uh, Linux is behaving. And these all are good things, right? But how can we check if the reasoning behind the documentation, behind the test, is co or coherent? How do we check if all our uh, asserts are not contradictory or leading to explanations that bring us to a deadlock or to a live lock in the reasoning of how things work or should work at least? And uh, how do we check that or, or verification is including all the possible cases that we are not forgetting anything. How do we, do we control this? So, so what do we need for trying to achieve or to resolve this problem? We need to find an uh, intuitive way to describe what we expect from Linux. Using methods that enable the verification of our reasoning and the verification of our explanation of how the system should actually works, and that allow us to get all the cases without forgetting a specific uh, uh, test or, or some uh, case we, we want to verify. And this all should scale well, right? Because a test would not be useful if it takes like two years to complete, right? We need to, to deliver a kernel faster than two years. So there is, I, I'm just already jumping to saying that we need formal models because we already have some formal models in the kernel and we are seeing the benefits of it. Kathleen has some of, of the, uh, applying formal methods for the spin locks and found bugs. We have the memory model. I have that preemptivity model that I am working myself. So it's not something new that we need formal methods, formal models modeling the Linux kernel. We already have very good examples, right? And, uh, but we need a more generic and, uh, or we need one generic and intuitive way for modeling the behavior that applies for other parts of the kernel. So how can we turn modeling, which is something we have on our minds as something complex, right? We do on the university and uh, we pass on exams and forget about it because it's complex. So how can we turn that complex thing a little bit easier for us? So we need to find a formal method that looks natural for us, right? That uh, that we can uh, 
express ourselves in a more easy way. And thinking about the runtime verification of Linux, or when it's running, how do we observe the Linux dynamics nowadays? Trace of events, right? We have a lot of tracing tools. We have F-Trace and BPF and uh, all that kind of stuff. And we are generally reading those traces and inside of our minds, we are drawing uh, state machines, right? We are thinking on state machines. We are not necessarily putting in the paper, but the wake up of a task, it brings us to a state in which, okay, the task is, 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 is ready to run. And uh, then we will need to wait for the SCAD switch for it to start actually running. So that's a somehow natural way of thinking for us. And also because all the operating system bugs have the state machines explain the states of processes and, and things like that. So this seems to be one possible, there, there should be more and for sure there are more, but this, is, this seems to be one way to go, one possible way to go. So state machines are used to, to model uh, event-driven systems. And event-driven systems are described as a sequence of events or a sequence of traces. And as I explained before, uh, we do this inside of our minds, but this actually is one example of a state machine that I use to report a bug to this bug uh, here. It's in the mall. And uh, here's the, the example of uh, of the model I submitted, and this is part of the work I'm presenting now. So. Okay. But if you are a friend of mine and were here last year, <laughs> you might recall that, okay, I talked about it last year, right? I was talking about the idea of using state machines and automata to describe the behavior of the task zone parameter RT. And at that time, I was thinking to use it for um, trying to extract var variables from the behavior of Linux to use on the real-time mathematics part, right? But at the end of the presentation, Masami came to talk to me and Peter and um, Arnaldo came to talk to me that we should try to move those, those things to model in a more generic way, to apply to other subsystems. Do you remember that? Yeah, okay, so I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> and they came, and also Clark, Clark Williams, my lovely manager, also came saying, oh, you should put more time on this. And we continue, right? We continue working on that. But just recalling a little bit, uh, this seems to be something that was drawn, right? I have uh, some balls and some, some, some points connecting one to the other. But this is a good thing about automata. Like it's a very simple format that we can understand. This is the initial state. This is the safe state or the final state. And we can see that uh, we can open a, here can be a socket and we can close the socket. And when the socket is open, we can send a request and read the request and send a request, read the request until we close it, right? It's straightforward to understand it. But in the back, we have a formal definition of those states. So one automata is a set of, uh, a, set, a finite set of states, a finite set of events, a set of transitions that say that, okay, if I am on the state, in one of the state and receive this event, I'll go to the next state. It clearly says, okay, this is my initial state, these are my final state. And the possible chain of events that are recognized by the, the automata is the, the language recognized by the automata. And the idea was that when we have one trace that is not recognized by the automata, we are seeing one event that should not happen at that point. For example, uh, I, could, 
I could not want to have a close here, return it to the initial state because then I would not wait to read. So we can model what we want and there is explicitly here what we don't want. And when we hit what we don't want, we can complain and say, okay, the system is not behaving as expected. But why, why use the automata? The good thing about using a formal method is that you can apply other methods on top of this. Like you can use formal methods to verify, verify if my model is, is deadlock free or live lock free using TLA plus like uh, Kathleen Marina's last year presentation showing like, you, are you present this year about the same topic again, don't you? Don't you need? <laughs> oh yeah. But that, that's one of, of the cases where you can use the, the way that he was testing using the formal method. So we can integrate with other kinds of verification to check our reasoning or if the kernel is behaving. And uh, also it enables the, the modular development of uh, a system. For example, I can get these, I can draw myself this, but I can do a more constructive way to reach the state of, to reach the description of the system. For example, this technique says that first I develop the simple models, as small as possible, for the operations that uh, are independent. So that model, I can say that I can open and close a socket, and then I can read and write a socket. Just to, this is a dumb example, right? If you want better examples, watch the last year's uh, talk. There is a useful example here, there. Uh, and so if I synchronize the, these two models, I have all the possible chains of events, those that are expected and those that are not expected, like closing a socket and reopen it to wait for the read, for example, or reading and writing while the sockets are closed. So we first draw all the possibilities and then work to cut enough the cases we don't want. And these are the restrictions imposed to the model. Like I can say that I can only close the socket when I'm not in the middle of an operation. So if one close happens here, this is not expected and this is a problem. At the same time, I can say that, okay, I will only start reading and write when I do an, after doing a open. And then I can synchronize these and do the verification. And here is I'm using a, a tool that does this. There are many of them, but here it says that system is blocking. It's saying that I cannot return to the initial state, so I have a live lock or a deadlock for my reasoning there. That's because I didn't say that I cannot close and write here. It was missing this part, right? I can. And it's not the case that I only need to read and write after opening. It's after opening and, uh, and before closing. And so synchronizing that, those generators and these specifications bring me back to the case we, we know it's correct. Why not just draw in it, Daniel? <laughs> yeah, okay, this was just a, an example to show the approach. But last year I presented the parameter T model that generated a state machine with 9,000 states and 23,000 transitions. So it's impossible to draw, to draw it, to draw it, right? At least, at least during my PhD time. And uh, all this reasoning and the, mod, the, construct, the way that we construct using generators and specifications and the verification of my reasoning show that my model here doesn't has something obviously wrong. Like it doesn't have a, a deadlock and doesn't have a, a live lock inside it. And during the development of the model, we found the three bugs that would not be detected by other tools. This idea of modeling the Linux of, uh, the, the behavior of Linux ended up uh, being, being accepted on three different papers that covers the, my, this, the, the, sto the story of uh, modeling the prime 30 behavior. So this is like, this means that 
I'm, I'm speaking about academic stuff applied to Linux, and the academy is accepting this as something not, uh, something useful, right? I'm not just uh, talking to myself. And, and this is good. Okay, so I was explaining how to model how the Linux behaves, uh, what we expected from Linux, but how to verify that the system is actually behaving as we expect, right? Is comparing the system execution against the model. And uh, last year, it was already possible doing it. I was doing with Perf, I was recording all the events, being, bringing them to the user space, and then later doing the post processing. Here, it was already running the, the comparison part, verification part, it was in O of one and we had good properties. But we have the problem of that, for example, on a single core box, in 30 seconds, I generated two gigs of data. So this wasn't that practical, right? And uh, but things changed since these slides, like Red Hat changed the symbol and it's more red than, than before. So no jokes about switching our color to blue. <laughs> but other than that, I developed a new approach. That is, rather than tracing in, in a verifying user space and require all the transfer of data from the kernel to user space and all that huge storage that it requires. I'm getting the model and I'm, I'm, using, I'm using Python to translate that model to C data structures. And then I use that, using that data structures, I connect the, the uh, verification code with the, the tracing functions of the kernel the tracing features, like I get the code generated and I hook one the handler of one event to one kernel event, and then I do the comparison in runtime. As long as as long as my system is accepting or the model is accepting the events that are coming, it's okay. If not, it generates a, a dump to the trace. And I can get the chain of events that bring brought me to the undesired uh, so how, how did you generate the model in the first place? Like the, the first stage, right? How, how did you get that oh. dot file? Oh, I'm using one tool, which is Supremica. That allows me to do the modeling and uh, the synchronization, the verification, and it exports in this format. But one can use the GraphViz to export it. Can use any format, any tool, that exports the result in the DOF, uh, on the GraphViz format, which is the DOF. So you did this for the preempt RT patch, that's it? Oh, I did, on, on the previous work, I did the model for the preempt RT, but you can model anything and translate into code. Okay. Yeah, you can model RSU and translate into code. Okay. So. But the, the question is like, if you are suggesting everyone trying to use your approach, yes, we need to have a common language of describing these automata. Yes. Yes. Do and that's the that's dot that's format. Just, well, the dot format is not a thing that you would have checked in into the repository, right? You you can use the dot format. Okay. It's a test. For, yeah, yeah. It's a but text th format. But this is already ge the generated part, right? Or is it just the this is the full automata. Right? It can be the full automata, it can be just uh, each model, but I'm using, for the verification, I'm using the entire model, the runtime, because this turns the operations out. But it's not, the it's not the generator and the constraints, right? Yes. It is, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You model everything, mm -hmm. and then you could run each automata for each event, but this would be O of N yeah. operation. When you have all the models synchron synchronized, the operation become O of one. That's why I'm using the full model to do the, in this part. But yeah, this dot format is a, is a text format, is an open format, and is provided by the GraphViz library, which is open too. And you think that's the, 
the right approach, the right language for I think it's that? one language. Well, one possible language. Okay. Uh, so how hard it is to write those models? Have you tried to write models for something else and what parts of the kernels may be good yes, candidates? Yes, it, it was the last year's presentation. I modeled the synchronization primitive. How the synchronization primitives of the parameter T are correlated and how they describe the execution of the uh, real-time test on the parameter T. And that is the model I'm mentioning here. Mm -hmm. Oops, wait, wait. Uh, that one. Yeah, this, this model, for example, mm -hmm. that, that describes the behavior of the parameter T. And these are the publications where you can read more about it. But this is all the same, same area. Have you tried to apply it to other things, like in your sockets, file systems, what other parts? That's why I'm trying to convince some people to do. Okay. <laughs> do you have the, any indication um, that it's, well, will be suitable for other parts of the kernel? How do you, how do you, check that uh, what you, the behavior of the system nowadays, the, well, the connections of tracing, the connection of, the connections that are happening. That's the point is that you can observe this using trace and you have trace points and you have function traces. So that's why I explained before that this would be suitable for other, other areas of the kernel. I would say for file systems, you probably want not just trace point, but trace and this contents of the files or okay. I don't know, some metadata or stuff. Okay, it depends on what, okay. This is for runtime verification based on events. It will apply for all the things that you can actually verify using trace. And there are many subsystems that people observe using trace. For this case, this would be a possibility, but I'm not trying to resolve all the problems of the world. If you want to do a, uh, instruction level verification, you can use other methods to describe, like Kathleen used for the, for the uh, spin lock. Um, there is another. So just, just if, you, if I understand correctly, so if we, you go back to the previous slide with the uh, parent RT, no, uh, with the model saying nine, yes. So uh, just to understand, uh, so you didn't generate all those states and all those transistors by hand. You have a no. method for that, an automated tool for that. Okay. I generated, I, by hand, I created 12 generators and 33 specifications. And the more complex one has just nine states, right? And then I synchronize them all and generate a model with 9,000 states. Okay. So this is, we broke the reasoning to have a small states to generate the big one. One could try to auto-generate this model using the trace. But if your system has a bug, the bug will be translated into the code as well. Yeah. And that's why it's better to do the manual thing than doing manual things step by step and trying to break down all the restrictions than doing a, an automatic right. one, but it's possible. Yeah, right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, but when you merge like the simple models, uh, so you have like some states that are not valid, valid right? When I, when I generated all, all the generators, yeah. I have a lot of states that are not valid. And then the specifications say, what are, what are the states I don't expect? Okay. And then it cuts down the states I don't expect and reduce okay. to the, the ones I expect. Okay, thank That's you. That's why when there's one event that is not expected, it's a problem. Uh, so maybe a little follow up to the question before. Um, it's, it's obvious that you cannot describe anything you can describe, everything you can describe in C with automata. So right. there must be no. portions of the kernel that do not fit to this approach. Sure. Do you think about um, where this approach applies and where it's um, limited? Anything that we can describe using state machines, like state of connections on TCP, states of, uh, of firewalls, anything that states and events we can model. Of course, but if I have, for example, some uh, some random decision somewhere, like in the crypto code, that wouldn't apply then anymore, would it? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, just yeah, yeah, yeah sure, 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 sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that's for, that's better for deterministic, there are, there are automata for non-deterministic cases, but it, this is better for deterministic cases. Well, I mean, you can make a non-deterministic automata for deterministic, yes. so uh, would you approach Yeah, 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 perfect, perfect. Would yeah, the approach also right. work with like um, uh, Markov chains? 
But could you generalize that from autonomous to remorseless things? I don't know. Good point. We need to think about it. Yeah, so Daniel, so you created this, this specification last year, um, and I assume you have it on your, on your laptop, right? And does it still hold this year? Sure. Um, so this means that the changes that have happened in the scheduler in the I'm last I'm not year modeling, yeah. I took care of modeling things that didn't, don't, don't change that often. Uh, I discussed all these questions last year and they are writing in the paper. Yeah. The point is that the things I described on that model are, didn't change in the last 10 years. They changed when we added SMP support or when we created the PremTRT model. But yeah, on that case, I took care of, uh, of this decision. Okay. On other models that might change, people might follow the, the code and try. So at the moment, you actually don't know if let's say some other scheduler developer could actually change the model that you have written the first time, right? Because you actually don't know if it's No, no, I just it's understandable. I, 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 I'm not, on that case specific, yeah. I'm not modeling strictly the code, but the abstractions that we use. Preempted disabled, nobody yeah. touch it. IRQ disabled, nobody touch it. The way that the restrictions to take RT log, mutex didn't work. The restrictions are supposed to take uh, spin lock didn't work. So I'm working on a level of abstraction that doesn't actually change every day. It's not one code of line that will change. It will break the entirely prem 30. So question I have. <coughs> so from the dot file, you generate that code that you plug into Linux and you verify that the behavior of the Linux kernel matches your model. Right. How do you verify that your model has certain properties? Okay. So before you For actually get to the kernel, kernel matches the model. Okay. Does your model satisfy certain properties? You use Which this in properties? The like saying if it's deadlock free or if there is Deadlock liveness or for example, uh, one thing is let's say floating point state saving and restoring. I can draw some state machine about when it needs to be. I could have the kernel, you know, some trace points that match, okay, my, it matches my model. Well, what if my model is strong? Okay. So I, can I prove that my, how do you do this in this step? I, mean, okay. I, I know how to do it in TLA plus, I have a model and uh, I can write some properties, like, okay, something eventually happens, like, uh, yeah. you know. You can check if something eventually happens in the model using TLA plus for automata. There are tools that make it. In the kernel, we need to compare one each other and see if there is, during the development of the model, you need to see if uh, your model is generating problem. When one problem happens, you need to check first if the problem is in your model or if it's in the kernel. But the problem is that on runtime, we have no current way to say that we exercised all the paths inside the Linux, right? That, that's a problem of runtime verification. I cannot exercise all the paths and see that we are covering all the cases. So for the modeling, you end up go, going this way, like you cut, the, you cut the events you don't expect and try to run the Linux and see if it's matching, matching and try to get a, to, to converge in a model that actually stabilizes. Is it? So I'm gonna say, Andreas, this will be the last question for a little while. We'll let Daniel do a bit more <laughs> of his talk because uh, otherwise we're just gonna cycle around asking no, questions. No, no, no problem. No, the question. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, so no, it's okay. If you're okay with the, that, the I just wanted to make sure good. you didn't get completely derailed. Um, you go. Yeah, I wanted to follow but up on two aspects that came up here. So one was about this dot file possibly being committed to the repository. Yes. Um, and yes, that of course bears the question that Lucas already brought up of actually making sure that we do not have a stale file that is actually lying around and describing something that may have been a state in the past but is no longer current. Okay, so yeah, for one, um, isn't the solution of that going to be like the same as with documentation that you need to break it down to a level and require that the individual stakeholders that are working on the code also update this abstraction as they make changes to the code, 
And also, do you have any tooling? You mentioned those generators to keep the model and the code in sync in both directions. Okay, that would be a development process. Developing the model, you should develop uh, along with the code. No, yeah, yeah, you, you, you need to have a person taking care of it, sure. It's like code. You are trying to, you are redescribing something that exists. You, you need to take care, a human need to take care. And if uh, the problem happens, you need to update the model, right? So I think we, if we want to keep them in sync, we need some kind of debugging config that will actually enable this checking at runtime. We, we were right there, yeah. Enabled on all of the CI and all of the tests. And in particular, yeah. one thing that we would like it. So one thing we consider doing with syscaller, which is a kernel fuzzer, is having some kind of a model and actually doing this. That's the part. So that's the part I will make question. We could potentially this is enable it during yeah. fuzzing all the going time. To the end, all the going to the end, that's going to the end. If we will arrive there, right? When arriving here, you say the question is okay. I'm loading. This is a a prototype. It works. People at the People at the academic, the academic world accepted this as a reasonable thing, so I'm just not talking to myself. <laughs> and I'm not, <laughs> so it was verified by experts on the area. I will present this work uh, next week at the formal, uh, Software Engineering Formal Methods Conference, which is very uh, formal methods people. So I'm, I'm not just talking to myself, right? Just let set it clear. And uh, I was just thinking uh, from an I was just thinking from an implementation standpoint. You, sh you said that you had to collect like two gigabytes of data or something. So hmm. something like this could be perfect for like doing in kernel uh, because you really don't need the data once you transition the state. Yeah, you can when throw away the trace okay, record, right? Okay, now we are making but questions that I will answer in the next slide. So Does it also answer how long you are measuring? Sorry? Does it also answer how long you are measuring? Because otherwise I quickly put that question. How long do you measure to, to achieve such? Okay, I'm running on the parameter T, which is the model, I'm running it uh, full, it's running, and it con trying to find bugs on the kernel since two years, since one year, more than one year. But wait, let, let me finish the, <laughs> so, this one simple example, this is not a full model, it's just a small model. It can be used to describe like test cases, and this one test case that I show here the code that it ended up translating. So I have a one enum that says the, the states that I have, Okay, this is actually automatic uh, generated code, right? I have the number of the set of states and the set of events, like the definition of the automata. And here I have uh, the, this is used for the bug to translate the enum into the name of the state for the bug. And this is a metric that connect it, that says, okay, I put all the state transitions here. So it's indexed by the state and by the event the initial state and the final state, and then it translates something like this, right? So this is the state zero, and these are the, tran the transitions that I can have. So when I get, when I'm processing one event that came from the, I hook it to an event in the kernel, and then it passes me the event I'm dealing now. So I get the current state, and I try to set the next state. If the next state is possible, is a valid state, like in more than zero, I go to the next state and it's done. I can print some debug and it's done. And uh, if these are error, error, I can print the error to the trace buffer and put a stack trace, for example. Right? All that operations that I mentioned are O of one. So uh, this is um, a vector lookup, vector lookup, matrix lookup, returning the current state, and setting the next state. So all the operations are O of one, and that's why we could scale well 
using this kind of abstraction for these kind of use cases, right? I'm not trying to save the world. <laughs> so, well, okay, there's no free meal. So I'm using uh, vector metrics that are not compact. But I tried to use other methods, and in the end, the, even for that model, the preemptive model, which is a big model, try to model many things, the, the model compiled was like eight k bytes of data, and which is, seems to be acceptable for the gains in the performance. So how efficient is this idea comparing to other things? Uh, how much does it affect the system execution, right? So I did two benchmarks, one about throughput and one about latency. I used the Pharonix test suite for the throughput and the cyclic test, which is the PremQRT testing tool that we use to measure the latency, our main metric, to see how much it affects the, the, the our, our metric, which is very precise. It's on the uh, microsecond uh, scale. I compared with kernel as is, doing nothing, just running, without any verification or tracing. And I did the, the same experiment with the model, one model, and tracing the system. Like just using trace point, uh, the F-trace, tracing the same events of interest of the model. And the good thing about F-trace that we know it performs very well and we can use it in production. So it's acceptable even in production, the overhead of, of F-trace when we are doing some kind of verification. And I'm just talking about tracing here, I'm not doing the the verification step, just recording the events, same events. So I'm using this use a simple model here just to illustrate. And it explains one case of the preemptive RT in which you have a lot of uh, functions that might eventually sleep. And that's a problem, the scheduling while in atomic problem in the preemptive RT. And we cannot uh, call them if we are on one with uh, either preempt or local RT disable or with buff disable, right? Just an example to take the metric. What matter here is not the size of the model, but the set of events, because I go one, O of one per event, right? And uh, it was good because I'm using buff uh, hook into the function tracer here, to the set of functions and hook into trace point. So I tried to exercise two parts of the tracer. For um, low kernel activation uh, benchmarks, both the results of the trace and the verification are, um, we can see them, but they are not that much. It sometimes looks like just noise in the experiment, which is expected. But when we try, obviously, when we try to exercise kernel functions, we will see more than mainly because the preempt disable and the local RT disable are operations that take very often in the preempt RT. And we obviously will see some performance draw here, but the model, because of the efficiency, is using, is adding less overhead than just tracing. And the explanation is that tracing, we need to, to, to save more data to the trace buffers. And we need to do more operations than just looking up in a matrix and uh, set in the next state and uh, saving it to one char or one integer. So for runtime uh, monitoring of the properties that we modeled, this is efficient enough to run in uh, production, right? As we can enable F trace in production. And uh, another good thing uh, regarding using O of one operations and storing low data is that here is the cyclic test output, right? This is the baseline, the, the, darker, the, the darker blue. And this is verification. You see that even though we have a shift here, which is expected, the line it draws in, in almost the same way. So it actually doesn't change that much the behavior of the system. So we have we have the same, almost the same behavior. What while doing with trace, we can have some some change in the behavior. And I, sorry. <laughs> okay. And 
as I said, I'm not just talking to myself about it. I sent this to one of the best conferences on the formal verification, the junctions of formal verification and software engineering, and it was accepted that I will present next year. So this added some grains of certainty in the model I'm developing. But I'm not trying to solve all the problems, and that's clear, right? So we have everything here in this page. So what can be next? Obviously, what I did so far, and that's why I'm a uh, plumber, so I'm not presenting a product here. I'm present an idea that is under development, and that's why I'm here asking for feedback. So loading a module and trying to do things more manually, in practice, if it becomes practical someday, uh, it's not uh, that easy and loading and keeping things. So the idea I talked to, to Thomas and Peter last year would be that to having these models up to date with the kernel, we need to use them as test cases for the kernel, right? And so we, while we are changing the kernel, we are observing if the things are still in the way that we desired. And then if there is some change in the kernel, we check if this is a bug or an actual change in the model that Linux behaves. And now the things that behaves in our older specifications needs to be adapted to the new model. For example, if I have a deadline scheduler that represents all the cases of the parameter T and the model changed and the kernel changed, the synchronization changed, we would have to change also the model that we use and also the things that, that uh, depends on that model, like when the scheduler implementation. So yes, the idea is that the models will adapt with the kernel and that's one of the reasons why we would like to have this closer and the same blob of the kernel. So what would be the, the interface that would be better to integrate this? Would be with perf, would be like a, a directory into the F traces even? Like we could generate these models, translate into code and have one interface like, a, like we do with a function tracer. Would we enable this tracer that verifies or not? Or should I use a, a more perf like uh, uh, interface using BTF? Uh, I, would I would say uh, see how easy it would be or difficult it would be to use the BTF and perf, uh, but okay. basically don't modify anything. But if you can do everything with that, might as well use it. If it becomes too complex, uh, then we can start looking at um, saying maybe we have something custom built that could help you do this. So I would say first start to see okay. the complexity of using the BTF and uh, perf, but then if you find issues, then you, then you, could, then you have an argument for why, because one, if you do like the verification um, interface first, the first question someone can ask is why don't you use the BTF? Okay, so yeah, do that, that, first. That, 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 was my, that was my concern as well. And uh, the other thing that which was the question that were raised. Uh, so is there any other thing that we can uh, that we can model and try to take advantage of this? For example, we have lock depth, but lock depth is not enabled by default because it, it's very heavy. And you cannot, even with lock depth enabled, you, can, you don't have a way to enable and disable it in runtime and have it compiled in the kernel. With the, with the idea of using the trace infrastructure, we can have all the modeling outside of the code and only hook or test cases into the already existing trace points. And some trace points for this case would be is even easy to justify, like to enable this kind of verification. So is, this is part of my project, is trying to convince other people to model other parts of the kernel, to even to justify that my idea that this is good holds, right? So I was wondering why, uh, instead of eBTF or something, why not just have the model as a part of the kernel itself? Like, I don't know what that will take, but assuming it's it's like an auto automata state machine kind of thing, like you can just like somehow hard code what that state machine yeah. looks like in the kernel itself, and then 
using a config option or something at yeah. both times. Uh, you know. But but the good thing about having the model as a tracer is that you can enable and disable it and not having any ov overhead of having it there and not having to recompile your kernel yeah. to yeah. to enable and disable. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that, make, that yeah, it's more because it gets more dynamic if we hook to the tracer thing than actually having it code hard coded in the kernel. And we could update things more easily. Yeah. Um, just a comment and idea. Um, maybe some kind of hands on session or a demo, especially from the part where you actually build the model. Because I think most yeah. of the questions were, okay, how hard is to yeah. actually come up with a model? So I guess it might help maybe convince people to try. Yeah. I was thinking to, I still didn't have time, but one idea was making a set of uh, how to to put on LWN in, LWN with video. I was wondering if and if so, how you contextualize your automata, for example, you had the open, write, uh, read, close stuff. How do you contextualize that per FD? Or oh, okay. Oh, that's like a good that. question. Yeah. You can have uh, these states associated. Just, just, no, wait, 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 wait. Just to, <laughs> just to see if I got the question, right? Yes, a model has a context. Like the parameter T model was for, for one task. Each task would follow the model. Actually, I'm translating it now to be per CPU, to check the states of the CPU because it could be more efficient, would be better. But there should be cases in which the model will represent the state of one file descriptor. Then you would have to have each file descriptor its own model. And then you need to find a way to store, the, you can store this in a, mo in a kernel module, not confuse with model, and have a hash table of uh, file descriptor and try to find it. Or if this get good enough, you might convince someone to have a a one entry in the definition of the file descriptor, right? But yes, you have, we have different uh, levels of, uh, we can have different levels of object that we are modeling. And it can be a, a file descriptor, a lock, or a CPU, or a task. Um, so we've gone past 6.30, but feel free to keep asking questions if anyone has them. Um, but if you wanted to go to another talk in another, um, there's like one or two mini comps still going, so just be aware that it's past six thirty. Otherwise, uh, if anyone has any more questions, I will throw you the. Ah, uh, you've got one there. Yeah, I was uh. just wondering. It kind of goes with the context. <coughs> so you're running, a, you're loading a module on a running system. So how do you know when you can uh, reach a yeah. an initial state of yeah. the automata? You need to wait for the initial state. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but you then you, you need, need to watch to the events. And try to see, like for example, these here. Oh. These here, I was waiting for the preemption and uh, IRQs to be enabled. Mm. Like, and then I can hook both cases. I hooked both cases and saw, okay, did I pa is it disabled and is it disabled? And I wait for this condition. And then, then I was sure that I was in the initial state, and then starting to trace. Okay. Yes, but you need to wait for this condition. Now that you mentioned initial state, does the acceptance state have any special meaning? Is it, uh, I mean, could you? Does, does the accepting state have any special meaning? Like yeah. the one with the uh, two circles, compared to the oh, ones yeah, with the yeah, single yeah. circle. Oh, yeah, 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 this is the final state. Yeah, but, but what, what meaning does it have? It means that it's a safe state where you can restart the system. Oh. If you mm. cannot, okay, and then you can conclude that if you cannot return to the initial state, you have a deadlock or a live lock in your, this is kind of conclusions okay. you can yeah. derive from such condition. So if the, it's live from each state, it can return to the, ni to the initial state, <coughs> and then it's, uh, it's, you don't have live lock. So. How much to wait, right? Depends on the algorithm. Yeah, you need you need to find a, this is a problem. You need to wait yeah. for the initial condition. You need to. <laughs> yeah, and so just to be sure, right, on the 
because you are at a, a formal conference uh, or on a formal methods conference next week. Um, if you have this kind of case where you say you have to return to a certain state, then it's actually not a finite automata, but it's a street automata. So there are automata types on infinite words, and there you have an acceptance condition where you say, I have to always, in an, in an infinite word, I have to be finitely often in a certain state. So okay. just that you know, like, yeah. because no, it's no, not yeah, a finite. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that's the base for automata, yeah. yeah. Good, thanks. So you said uh, if you do not make it back to the start state at some point, then you can conclude that you have a deadlock or a live lock. Okay, in the reasoning, in the model. Right. Oh yeah. For a live lock, about. isn't there a temporal or iter iteration count component? Is that how you decide? Okay, that that would be an extension to the type of uh, automata that I'm using. Okay. Now I'm using the automata that doesn't count, which is the more simple automata, which is the one that blocks me less for using other extensions of automata. But there are parametric automata where you can put counters. So and at that point you could classify something, yes, this is a live block, we've been here this many times and. Yeah, and, and, then, and then you have a more ways to ex ex express or condition. Okay. Yeah, but I decided to use more simple automatas at the beginning of the modeling because I can then, uh, Use a more specific cases, and the other way around would be harder. So, um, if if you introduce counters, can you still apply your formal verification techniques then on these extended automata? That's a future work. Okay. And does the accepting state always need to coincide with the initial state, or can not it necessarily? Be, can be different states. Yeah, can no, have no, more no, than no. one acceptor. Yes, there can be. Depends on the thing that you're modeling, but it's possible. This there is. There is just one initial state in the automata definition, but there can be more than one, and that's why it's a set of initial states, set of final states, sorry. Where is this? So for example, here, it's a set of final states. Do the yeah, first, like in the standard yeah. Have you thought about how you might be able to extend this for situations where you have multiple state machines and you need to reason about the concurrent interactions between them? So okay. for example, if one has to synchronize with another, and you probably can't just rely on things like timestamps for that. Okay. The idea here is that you have uh, all the interactions in a single model. Right. Even you need to, to be able to express even the concurrence in a single model. How would you get that? How would you verify that with per task trace points though? You'd need sort of concurrent trace points to assert concurrent assertions. Like, for example, you need to know oh when okay. certain synchronized, I don't know how you would do that, that would work. Okay. The discrete event systems, it assumes that the events uh, take uh, one after the other in discrete time. Mm -hmm. So the automata cannot describe two that uh, occurred exactly at the same nanosecond. It could, but you can describe before or after, right? But when you are thinking about like the concurrence of one task and the states of one task, you would hardly have, you would not have one or after the other. But uh, in exactly the same time, you need to find the old, maybe all the other tractions or try to, to assume all the cases, even before or, or after. Yeah, I think that in the end, if you have such interaction in kernel, you need some, some kind of synchronization mechanism to do it. I said, I mean, so th there are some cases, for example, where, and it's quite unusual, I think Paul McKenney is responsible for most of it, but where you may have two threads storing to the same variable and one of them will overwrite the other variable and neither of them know which one won, but you can use that property to uh, assert something happens later on. But if one wrote after the other, mm -hmm. they didn't happen at the same time. My point is more that you can't tell which order they wrote in unless you read the thing back, and then you're going to be introducing quite a lot of okay. Uh, but then, but then, but then, if, if you wanted to, okay, this is one point. If you wanted to do this kind of analysis, you need to trace the operation of the two, and so you would see them taking place, right? 
Right, but the order in the trace might not be the order of the writes. That's the problem. So you need to somehow, oh, okay. you somehow need to relate the trace to the memory model. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. And that, this that's guy, really this exciting, when, but when, I don't when, know how when, you do when, it. When, when, when yeah, we will reach we will reach to this point, and these yeah. are advanced points that we might find problems in. Right. Yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was, as I understand it, all these uh, events between the states are all like function calls, but like, I presume you could get into bad states by you know by assigning variables. To you yeah, know. but then this that's why this work. The, this kind of uh, modeling works only when you can, when you have the event you want to observe. This is not for all the cases. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if you thought about that at all, like yeah, yeah. how, if, how if you could possibly model. Yeah, you would have to put a trace a point right into that uh, place to to be able to monitor. So this is for the events that we can have on the kernel. Okay. Yeah, the, you would have to edit one event right right, in, right into that that um, memory and then to monitor it. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question. Um, so all the, the state diagram you're describing is just for one CPU, right? No, you, you have you, multiple you, you, CPU, you, you have different CPU at different state and there yeah. will be interaction between them. And then you can have, you need to have a global model that would uh, hook to the, that's the question that he uh, asked. You can have a per CPU model and then you can have a global model. The difference between the per CPU model is that I, I will only try to move the states if I'm taking place on the CPU. If I have a global model, I will, tr I will try to move the, 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 the automata with the events from all the, all the models. If I have a per file, uh, only the events from that file. And then we need to filter this case. Was that the, but this an, it's possible to express a global models using the automata. Mm -hmm. it, do, it only changed the way that you model your, your, your system. Have you considered or um, tested whether expressing your generators in temporal logics, LTL, whatever, works maybe better for some of the, especially for like programmers who maybe don't know how to write dot files. No, could you? Uh, like uh, temporal logics is a way, is like a way to express uh, yeah. simple automata that you can test against other automata and you could maybe use those in place of your graphical automata in order to write the expected the, the, the expectations against the system. Yes, yes. And use that for generating your... Yeah, specifications, yeah. Yeah. But there should be a way to express the same thing with the generators, because if you can translate that idea to automata, you can translate to the graphical format. But it doesn't matter if you write in the graphical format or in the automata format, because they are interchangeable, right? Well, my proposal is to use maybe, or, well, my question was whether you assessed if temporal logics were a suitable representation for your generators that might have more exceptions no, I, I with your community. I didn't, I, we need to sit down and, and try to understand the, the temporal, how do you model the things in temporal logic? Okay. And, uh, yeah. So I if you augmented your, um, your states with timing information yes. so that you can um, yeah. uh, measure the, dis the, the temporal are, distance are between events, would you say that's a good idea then to come up with a worst case execution time estimates by oh, calculating okay. that, 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 that paths? That's something that is very used in the real time academic world, yeah. which is representing the system as a timed automaton. Yeah, it's, that's why I use the most simple case of automata first because later we can extend to use other kind of automata, mm -hmm. which are the timed automata, the parametric automata, but these are all things that we still need to develop. Okay. This is in the early stage, but I tried to take care of using the tools that would allow me to go forward. Because sometimes if you do timed automata first, you cannot, it's hard to get backwards and try other things. Well, uh, this is not a, a question, but a comment. Uh, Arnaldo today in his presentation about eVTF and Perf, he, he was talking about uh, the plans uh, to use the uh, Intel PT, the, uh, the, the hardware tracers, uh, the interaction, to create the events for Perf. 
So uh, the, the amount of events that you can use uh, in, in your uh, automata will grow significantly and it, it may help you to do things that you wanted to do that may be related to memory address or to uh, access mm -hmm. to a ses uh, certain variable. So uh, that is something that soon may be possible. Yeah, th that's why it's good to rely on the trace things because they are evolving and it, there we, we have more and more and more possibilities of tracing things. Um, have you thought about um, whether there could be things that we as contributors and maintainers could do in the Linux kernel source code to facilitate for one generation of models or verification of models like have you thought about any form of uh, macros to annotate state variables or anything like that? Yeah, I think that the demand, the demand for new events or to know that something happened, uh, they will take place during the development of the model. And then we have one very specific case of, uh, of a maintainer that doesn't like trace points, for example, which is something that we hook. And this person is Peter Zilstra. <laughs> and uh, well, actually, that's changing now. It's uh, he had trace events. No, yeah, that, yeah, that, that, yeah. that that's Not where we point. will we will arrive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, I had a long time discussion with uh, Peter for having traces for the SCAD deadline, right? And uh, last year, I, I think it was in the LPC. We got him the acceptance that we can add the trace events to the kernel, but not trace points. The difference is that trace events, am I? The other way. Or the way around, the other way around, okay. Yeah, the other, we can have trace points as long as we don't export the trace event interface for user space. So the idea is that if we don't export user space, we can get rid of it when we don't need it anymore. So we can add the trace uh, points to the kernel as uh, on demand, like when, when we need it, and try to convince the maintainer with this argument. Daniel, I have a question. Sorry. So, um, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so Dr. Uh, trace event uh, actually uh, uh, record that there's some, uh, passed uh, some uh, argument, but the trace point does not. So that, uh, that uh, I think that uh, the big uh, difference. So which one would you need? It seems that uh, just uh, using that the trace point or trace event you need. Okay, I'm I'm hooking to the trace point. To the to the trace point and, and so not not just just the, the let's say uh, the pass uh, execution pass is the the matters for okay, you. So just wait. Can one? Close the door because there is coming the noise and I'm not. So, so that's uh, the event point, you know, uh, the other, uh, where, uh, what happened is uh, uh, the matters. I didn't, sorry, didn't get the. So that's, uh, the I, I think that uh, that one is uh, just uh, using, uh, changing that uh, the state machine, uh, machine state uh, by your, uh, what's the, by the event, so that a trace point, and and it doesn't uh, check that the, the event, uh, what's the, uh, the argument or something like that. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm just using one event to, uh, to, I'm just analyzing one event and not the content of that event, right? Is that the point? Okay, so, if we had parametric automata, we could do the checks in the automata, right? In the current uh, mode of automata I'm doing, I need to decide which automata, which automata event fire based on the data that I can get in the, in the trace point, right? And then I multiplex in one possible kernel event into different uh, automata events in the code there. But in the, when, in the, if it, all this idea justifies continuing developing this, and if we need to use the time and automata, we could decide it in the automata itself by passing the parameters and passing the data of the trace point 
Pastor's book. About trace points, uh, so you can actually pass arguments as uh, you would do with a simple function call, right? So you can pass data. It's just that uh, it, uh, it is not exposed to user space oh, in yeah. a fixed layout. So this yeah. is the only difference, but you can pass arguments. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The audio, when we hook to a trace point, you need to make a function that receives the same arguments of the trace point. So I receive the same thing that the, the tracer would receive. And then I can do the same manipulation that trace would, would do, could do. Yeah, the information is available for me inside as well. The only point is that it's not exposed to user space, so no user can use it. It's just a module. So, so. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So I was wondering how hard, how uh, weird would a model look that actually had events in like interrupts, uh, you know, and non-interrupts context. So you have like A and B like in process yeah. context and then interrupts have, have other events. And so you have to somehow join all of them. So then you'll have like back and forth between all the states between the two contexts. Like is that gonna be hard? Because something like, for example, RC is that's very common to have. Yeah, that, that is actually the case that we got the problem in the, in the F trace, in the, trace points code on the F trace tool. The prempt disable trace point. Because, okay, when we are running, we assume that the event took place, uh, uh, took place, right? But actually the, the heat of the event and the event itself, they take place on different timings. And so we need to synchronize both. So to create the idea that this was one atomic operation the real event and the event we are tracing itself. Generally, and, and this is one case where the interrupts can add a noise because like I, I disable the preemption counter and then I would print the trace point. I can have an interrupt here and this can, and in my next trace point that can disable interrupt here will not fire. That's actually this case here. Right, this one case in which the interrupt messed up the, the events. So yes, the, but this is not a problem of the way I'm checking, but the consistency in the trace uh, subsystem that we need to have the real event and the trace event or trace point of that event synchronized. They are generally synchronized already because for example, when you are dealing with the scheduler, you need to take, take the locks of the scheduler and then, for example, you will not have a reentrance in the scheduler code to mess up with event. And as the scheduler also can be manipulated, scheduler data can be manipulated and interrupts, interrupts are already disabled. So generally, there is a natural synchronization uh, between the both events. But there are cases in which we need to enforce this. And that's the case that we have in the in this problem with the, the trace point that we had to enforce in the end. Uh, yeah, so it's not uh, as cash hot as it was when I wanted to re reply. Uh, just back on the trace point versus trace event thing. The problem is not necessarily as having that exposed to user space, it's just not having the format of the event committed in the kernel. By having just a trace point, you force people who want to have their trace events to write their own modules, but then it's not ABI, it's their module. So yeah. Just, yeah. Okay, any more questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much to Daniel.